so uh, thank you guys for uh, sticking around for this uh, panel after you know, sort of the conversation got started for me. I, I came here just two hours ago and I already feel energized and inspired um, by, um, by the, sort of the, sort of the energy, the buzz, and, and the sense that I had just shortly with me here that you guys are all making history uh, and, and, and moving forward with a very positive uh, agenda. My name is Roberto Varea and it's my, my, I, my honor to be here uh, moderating a panel that was originally convened by uh, Michael Malik and Catherine Corey, who couldn't be here. So um, they, they reached to the, the bench and um, uh, asked me to, 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 to connect with uh, this work uh, that is about framing uh, MENA content in uh, academia. Um, my work is from, from the Latinx uh, perspective. Um, I started uh, the Performing Arts and Social Justice program here at the University of San Francisco. We're turning 20 years next. Uh, <laughs> and um, and uh, of course, I, I, I admire and support as much as I can the work of Golden Thread and, and uh, everything that, that, that uh, comes from this amazing company, Taranj and the whole gang. Um, so I will introduce um, uh, the panelists. I will share with you quickly the, the, the framing questions that um, gather us in reflection, uh, but certainly with a desire that this becomes a conversation. Um, so we're going to begin with a sh short statement uh, per uh, panelist, um, but it, we definitely would, would love for this to be a dialogue amongst all. And, uh, without further ado then, the framing questions for us are sort of examining the role of the academy in re relationship to MENA theatrical production, training and publication, um, how in the traditional university theater system there has been little room for MENA playwrights in the American theater canon, leading to a paucity of representation of MENA writers, directors, actors, and designers. And some of our framing questions are, why aren't MENA playwrights regularly taught in university college curricula? Why aren't more academic theater programs, including MENA works, in their seasons? What can be done and what has been done in uh, the experience of the panelists and what we can contribute to this conversation uh, to engage uh, MENA content in the academic curriculum, the campus stage, and in the area of publication? What strategies can uh, be employed or have been employed that can result or have resulted in more MENA plays produced by university and college departments? And also in the area of scholarly publishing in <coughs> trade journals or books. And how can theater and performance studies scholars create more books, essays, dissertations, and other publications focused on MENA work? So again, a container to reflect on, but but not limited to, and, and uh, if you already feel that there are some critical questions missing, please contribute with, with those uh, as the conversation ensues. So I'm going to introduce um, uh, the, the panelists very, very shortly. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a, a lot I could say about each one of them, but they were all very kind to agree to have a very short bio. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to do it um, for, for, for three of them because um, the, we decided to expand the panel with uh, those present, and so um, uh, we're, we're going to have two folk who are going to be here with us to share in their perspective from their work in academia, and uh, um, whose bias I don't have, but they will contribute some, <laughs> some other crit critical, vital information about themselves. But um, I am going to introduce them in the order in which they will be sharing a short uh, statement. So beginning uh, with, um, Leila Modrizadeh, who is a theater artist and educator with a focus on theater for social justice and community-based theater. And she's sitting there with her glasses on her head. <laughs> um, besides her career as a professional stage actress, she's best known for her solo shows and also collaborations with Ping Chong and Company for the past 24 years. She currently teaches at UC, Ber at UC Berkeley and has previously taught at San Jose City College, Ohlone College, Baruch College, Texas Tech University, and the University of Mississippi. Next, um, Tariq Hamami, who teaches at the um, City College of New York, and uh, who, when his turn comes, is going to share a couple of, of uh, things about himself 
uh, followed by uh, Josh Saburi Zadeh, who is a graduate student at the University of Missouri. And then we're going to hear from um, Natalie Handal, who has worked on over 20 theatrical productions, either as a playwright, director, or producer, author of eight plays, and her most recent work has been produced by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Bush Theater, and Westminster Abbey in London. She teaches researches the Nina Diaspora in Literature, Theater, and Film at NYU. Her recent poetry collection, Life in a Country Album, is praised as illuminating the luxuriance and longing of the Russian <coughs> nation, a contemporary Orpheus. <laughs> Natalie. And last but not least, fresh from SFO, <laughs> <laughs> Leila Buck has performed and developed her work at the Public Theater, New York Theater Workshop, Cleveland Public, Mosaic Arena Stage, Cult Shakes, and the Wilma. She has lived, performed, and taught theatrical tools for literacy, conflict, resolution, and intercultural communication to UN delegates, aid workers, youth, and leaders throughout the US, Europe, China, Australia, and 11 Arab countries. Uh, she's part of the inaugural Emerging Writers Group at Public Theater, Usual su Suspect NYTW, and an MA adjunct professor at NYU. So let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> and we're going to start with Leila. forward in academia, and I came up with a couple of things. Um, one is interdisciplinarity. I feel that if, as academics, if we can partner with Near Eastern Studies or Middle Eastern Studies or whatever they call their departments, um, there's a way to find not just support and sponsorship there and more audience, but also there's a lot of power, I think, for theater departments to partner uh, across discipline. Um, in answer to those questions, I, I think you know there's underwear racism that runs, and that's probably part of the reason why you don't see as much um, <laughs> produced by MENA playwrights. I, I also think there's a certain lack of knowledge uh, and accessibility to the to the work and the playwrights. Um, I mean, I'm at UC Berkeley where the they're pretty conscious. I mean, they're very progressive in terms of, I think we have Taranj coming to direct soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so they really do try. Um, but a lot of places where I've been, um, there's a kind of tokenism that, that happens where they'll have a pretty, you know, white dominant traditional male canon represented, and then they'll have the one slot. Mm -hmm. They'll have the African American play or <laughs> the Asian play or something. So I feel like as, as long as they have a tokenism mentality, it's gonna be hard to, mm -hmm. to make what we do integrated into just, oh, it's just one of the many great things. It's, instead it's like, oh, well that's the little uh, sidebar slot. Um, so that's why I think that happens. So, so one thing was interdisciplinarity and, and pairing with other departments, especially the departments of Near Eastern and Middle Eastern Studies. And the other one was building relationships with whoever's on um, the play selection committees. I mean, I, I end up sometimes being on those committees, but if you're if you're in a, a school that doesn't have kind of open sharing around choosing the season, I would say make friends. Really build just human relationships with the folks that are on those committees because um, you can try and, you know, what do they say? Decolonize their minds or <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to open people up and, and they, they can't be forced open because then you have like a liberal white guilt that starts to play and, and that something funny about that. So I think it's about real relationships. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, that's all. That's what I thought. Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Uh, Patty, if you could please say a couple of words about your work and jump in. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tara Kamami and um, uh, I teach at the City College of New York and uh, the Borough of Manhattan Community College, both part of the CUNY system in New York. In terms of my work in academia, um, I teach, I'm a playwright uh, uh, by profession. 
Uh, I will teach playwriting when we can get a section of it going, but for the large part, I teach introduction to theater. So my work in academia largely deals with uh, students who are 18, 19, maybe even 20, who have just left high school and uh, have never seen a live stage production before in their life. Uh, and I know this because I asked them uh, mm. on the first day of the semester, have you ever seen a live stage production before? So my class is mainly an introduction to them for just the world of theater as a whole, uh, which has issues in and of itself to get how much can you get in in a semester. And in terms of getting uh, MENA artists on stage in academia, there's, there's obviously many problems that, that we face that we're all gonna talk about, but I, I do find a large uh, part of it is that there is this want to do the familiar at a college. Um, and they want to do things, you know, anything that was done, that was created from 1950 to 1975. And so you get a million productions of Edward Albee and David Mamet and Damn Yankees, you know, so. And of course, that excludes not just MENA artists, but female writers, African American writers, um, Asian writers as well. And so I think uh, there, there needs to be a push for not uh, for current theater, and that will I think will also help nurture bringing in uh, not just being artists but artists of many different uh, backgrounds because as we know for a long period of time not that it's that all that much different now but during that period of time you know people I mean artists female writers African American writers were not allowed at the table were not being produced and so of course they're not in the canon of what these colleges are uh, looking for. So um, that among, among many other things. Thank you, Derek, and thank you for reminding us that there are different ilks of universities with different kinds of visions, and some are very conservative, others more progressive, so the, the strategy will not be the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, Josh? Uh, yes, so my name is Josh Saburizade. I go to the University of Missouri, Columbia, and since I'm still a graduate student, I am not, as far as what I do, a lot of what I do has been appointed to me by those that are in higher positions. But, uh, so, in terms of taking control of the, the work that I do and the research that I do and the knowledge that I produce, um, has been about exploring my own uh, identity construction, how I've come to understand who I am and how uh, that is impacted by how others view me. And uh, I'm right now working on an autoethnographic study which takes my own life experiences as data and as research and puts that into a larger project of a solo performance uh, and that that is knowledge. And um, in terms of like what our university does or our department does, I think that our, our theater department is actually uh, very strong in terms of um, the diversity of stories that are represented on stage and how students can create their own knowledge based on their own experiences and have space to perform those on stage and in the campus community. So I feel very fortunate to be in that program. Uh, but then the weight is on me, the pressure is on me to communicate that, uh, that knowledge, that story, uh, which is scary, mm. uh, but also uh, empowering. Thank you. Um, Natalie. Hi, it's so wonderful to be here. Uh, I want to take just a, a step back a little to, to look at the evolution of uh, where we were and what we've come in the last 20 years. Um, because when I started off, and Layla and I sort of started off together, there was actually nothing in academia that, that we were not present anywhere. And uh, I mean, there was like the classical texts that were taught at, I mean, usually the Middle Eastern departments, uh, were rather conservative, they were teaching classical, and in the other departments, we were absent. 
And I think in the last, I think we've, we have a lot to work, we, we have a lot of work to do, but we've moved forward in amazing ways. I tell educators <coughs> that it's important for us to create new syllabus um, mm -hmm. so that the students have other classes that they can, uh, they can take. So for me, when I was, you know, until 9-11, I was pretty much invisible uh, in, in the in academic setting. I couldn't say, I couldn't speak about my back, where I came from. Uh, my story <coughs> usually, although they were war-based, uh, people didn't know what, uh, either they didn't know and or I was told I should never mention the word Palestine. Mm -hmm. So the fact that today and for the last 15 years and especially for the last 10 years, I've been teaching the diaspora, and the, I, it's the Asian diaspora, so it goes you know, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East, um, uh, West Asia, uh, and that creates a, a lot of conversation. First, it exposes us to each other, so it creates a certain kind of connectivity so that we don't live in sort of these isolated places. Second, um, it is part of the class that they have to interact and they have to go to, um, to see plays and interact with artists. So for example, I have a lot of guests, Leila has been my guest. I've had a lot of writers. Um, I encourage uh, sometimes an artist from one part of the world that's doing something completely different aesthetically so that we can speak about <coughs> diversity and aesthetics, a hybrid, because finally, as was spoken um, before on the notions of identity and its complexity, we speak so much about identity in, in, um, in the classroom and how to really uh, bring those stories uh, to the public. And so it's important that we start allowing that in the classroom so that the young writers can know that that's possible. So many times they come and say, can I actually write a story like that? Can I present it in this way, in this fashion? So this is very important um, uh, to, to, to work and earlier on, we spoke about having more critics in, 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 and, have, and creating organizations. All this is, is what we have to bring to the classroom so that they know that they are the ones, just like we did back years ago when we created the bra. <laughs> it's terrible to say we're, just, we're only getting younger. <laughs> um, when we created the bra, Leila can tell you, I, I'll still remember, I still remember it was probably the most incredible moment in my life to get there and to have theater artists coming from uh, all over uh, the Middle East and in our voices, with our stories, we were on stage. It was electric um, and I think it's grown so much and I see what the students know compared to what they didn't know 10 years ago. And of course, there's a whole landscape. I travel all over the country and I might go to Rhode Island or I don't, uh, another town where they are not aware. But what I know for sure is that through stories, we make connections. And when we've made these connections, the students then have to really think about what, is it, what does it mean to come from the East and also, most importantly, um, you were speaking about this idea of uh, perhaps our communities are not in agreement back to where we came from. But here we're having an American, we're having a conversation about what it means to be American <coughs> too. So we have a different experience. <coughs> so these are all conversations that we need to bring to the classroom and we need to connect with people working professionally and those new generations and that new generation. Yeah, uh, I have not been texting. I've been taking notes <laughs> for the record. Um, but yeah, just to jump on some of that, um, uh, I I think the the I come to academia as a practitioner, right? And so um, I'm grateful, and I want to just name. Uh, you know, I started to your point, Josh. I started writing as a performer. Uh, you know, I was. My first play that I wrote was at my undergraduate thesis, right? And because I had an advisor who was an, an adjunct professor, right? Um, who was a working professional director who encouraged me, based on my life experience, to write my first play. 
Um, he still, you know, and another professional playwright who was visiting for one semester, um, Robert Myers. So Tim Raphael, who now runs the Newest Americans program at Rutgers, New York, a wonderful director. Robert Myers, who now runs the Center for American Studies at AUB, um, also a wonderful playwright. They were the working artists who um, were there for a semester and changed my life. Um, and so that is how I started writing. Michael Malik Najjar is uh, how I got that play published in for you know um, my first play, um, which has been a huge uh, thing. And his I now te I love that I get to now teach his work in a class mm -hmm. at, uh, that I teach um, for undergraduates. And um, Catherine Corre um, was first of all uh, to that point about Mibras, which was our first Arab American theater company in New York. Uh, back in 2001, we began before 9-11. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things we ended up producing was in collaboration with Catherine because she is also a practitioner within academia who works also within academia at NYU and through partnership with New York Theatre Workshop at NYU, we did a festival of eight plays from and about Palestine called Aswat. Um, that was a collaboration between this you know, academic institution and professional theater institution uh, because of, you know, largely because of Nibras' connection to New York Theater Workshop and because of Catherine's connection to NYU and just, I mean, Catherine is the ultimate connector um, in so many ways. Catherine is also the reason that I was connected to another working artist at NYU, um, Kristen Horton, who's a fantastic director um, who teaches at NYU in their Gallatin Interdisciplinary uh, Department which is where I now teach, essentially because Kristen is a working artist who um, recognized something that she thought was a value in someone with, I don't have an MFA, I have an MA, um, I don't have a PhD, um, and so the, the invitation to join an academic institution um, as an individual artist in that way was an opportunity, again, by a practitioner who was within that, who, who was bridging those worlds. Um, I also, when I was a master's student at NYU, the way I got through that was because at first, I, I frankly struggled with the, I, I resist academia in general sometimes as an artist because, uh, not, not entirely, but um, yeah, there are things about the way we define research and um, practice that felt constraining at the time. And I was a working artist and uh, only able to take like one class a semester basically. Um, and it, uh, it was because I had a working artist as a mentor, Judith Sloan, that I was able to complete that degree and complete a second play as my thesis because someone understood the value of that versus the kind of research that another wonderful professor, but who was more strictly an academic, did not understand. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to name that those people who have been there to, to sort of grab hold and lift up and recognize and value and support um, and the value of practitioners within academia. Um, and uh, so now I get to teach a class on participatory performance and community engagement. I get to teach a class on representation of um, Arab American, more primarily focused initially, and now um, it will expand to sort of writing beyond our borders more largely. So about any group that you are not a part of, which for many playwrights is what we mostly write about. It's not always our own experience, right? Um, I've had Andrea in my class. I've had all, all kinds of people within our community to run, Skyped in, we had, you know, so I feel like uh, being able to have working artists in the room to teach Yusuf's plays, to, you know, to really be able to have the voices of practitioners within the classroom is so vital. And I'm grateful, you know, Catherine even reminded me before this panel, speak as an artist, speak as a practitioner, you know, and uh, I think overall within academia, I'm grateful to the, uh, the Gallatin School at NYU, which is interdisciplinary, because there's an energy of understanding that mm. there can be this bridging between you know, more pure academic uh, research and practice. Um, and I think my brain just shut down, so that's what I'll say for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and I, just, I just wanted to add, like, when she was, uh, of course, Catherine, she's an amazing example of um, just like being here with all of you, of how really we can help each other and how we can connect. It really, it's each other, and wherever it is we are, whether we're practicing or we're teaching or whatever we're doing, that is where the power is. It's just very strong in what we can create and how we can move forward. And just one more thing I wanted to, on my little note here, is just to name the financial realities 
um, yeah. uh, yeah. that depending on the institution, yeah. but the, the the privilege that is required just to get the degree that you know not you know. We, everybody works hard and gets all kinds of loans to do it. It doesn't mean you have privilege if you have that degree, but what people have to sacrifice to do that and what that means about access mm -hmm. um, and how that intersects with whose voices are represented I think is really important to name when we talk about mm -hmm. any yeah. academic institutions in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you all, and, and uh, so so many ways that we could we could move from here, and, and I know eventually soon we'll, we'll be opening it up. But I just wanted to throw a couple of questions at you guys now. And, and you, you've mentioned different areas and, and, and aspects. You've nuanced a lot what, what we began to, to discuss, the idea of, of uh, scholars, uh, people who are there to do uh, research work is mostly driven by, by writing and criticism and, and, and so forth, and, and the, the figure of the artist scholar, so the, the person who's also there to contribute and the university recognizes research and publication uh, that normally takes the shape of a, a journal article or a book, also as um, creative work, right? And so this is also an, an important sort of, sort of point where the university honors the work of an artist scholar as research when it could be directing, acting, playwriting, etc. cetera. Um, within uh, that, that, that world, in, and in regards to, to either putting your foot in the door um, to, to be a part of, of be, uh, having a seat at the table and all these metaphors we can think of, uh, and or dealing with obstacles. Um, is there anything you guys can share as in um, both articulating the, the uh, perhaps a sense of, of, as it was mentioned, some net, uh, friendships, network building, uh, how, how to access, resor uh, access resources, um, between this, this, this worlds of, of what's uh, considered uh, more creative work, what's considered more scholarly work, and also within the MENA ac academics, as, a, as the, it's also, uh, I imagine as when we think about Latinx, Chicanx, uh, um, the, we, or Asian American, where we are um, often uh, forced by the mainstream narratives into conversation with each other when those not normally would happen, but in the, the, the stage becomes an incredible platform to play out that connectivity, right? It, it, I'm sure it's, it's the same for you as it's for Latino plays where there's a, a, a Mexican story that's been embodied by actors from Argentina, Chile, and Nicaragua, and so forth, directed by Brazilian and, and all of the above, right? Because we're all Latinx, right? So what, what, what uh, of that is important in regards to sort of breaking through has been in your experience that, that sort of um, acknowledgement of that common ground, connectivity um, amongst those differences in academia? Um, I just, just on that, I want to recognize someone brought up the census, which I think in, in the academia is very important in terms of scholarships, grants, you know, helping mm -hmm. people. And because institutions are, are gatekeepers, you were talking about this, Without the designation of, of being something other than white, um, we, la we don't get the same attention and, and funding a student wouldn't. And that's why maybe some of, it's a little bit more obvious to say, we're doing a Latinx play, we're doing an African American, but, but this is mm, nebulous territory when we don't even have a box for the students mm -hmm. to, to check. Yeah, to kind of uh, piggyback off of that, I, I think that this idea of diversity uh, is something that a lot of academic institutions talk about, um, but I think we're at a point in time where we need to think about what does that word include. Um, the, the, the schools that I teach at, City College and, and BMCC, uh, lucky enough, they do at, take risks on plays and they do a lot of different um, things, but you know, I used to teach at another school in suburban Pennsylvania, and this was the one time in my life where I actually had control over what plays could be produced. And um, there, was, there was a bit of pushback on what I could present there, I, maybe largely because it was a Catholic university, but um, not so there was, there was a kind of pressure on what you could do, what you can't do, and then you add in the structure of what academia is in terms of employment, where I was an adjunct, most people are adjuncts, and adjunct work means you can be 
let go at any time, without reason, at any moment. Um, and so there is this added pressure to it. Um, and even in terms of faculty, uh, what is diversity? I've applied to many jobs to departments that say, that pride themselves on, we are a diverse uh, uh, department with many different backgrounds, and you look at the faculty list, and there's not a single Middle Eastern person on there. And I can say, well, I know for a fact you have at least one Middle Eastern person applied to this job. So all that to say is I'm not sure in terms of when we're talking about census and what you were just saying, that, that box that you have to include yourself in, when people are even in academia are thinking about uh, what, is, what is diversity, many times Amina artists are not uh, thought of in that, in that realm there. Uh, I hope this connects, uh, it does in my brain right now, so hopefully it does. Um, just in terms of uh, adjust the balancing of the specificity of our communities and then the connectivity, right? And I often feel, even with the course I've been teaching, wanting very much to say, I wanna teach a class about specifically what I know best, which is the Arab American theater, um, and not pretend that I know basically almost anything, uh, you know, I know very much less about uh, Iranian American theater, Turkish, I, I, you know, as it is, Arab is a vast category, right? And so being able to focus on that initially and then being encouraged to expand so that, you know, expand the access, expand the interconnectivity, which I also love because I'm getting now to sort of adjust the syllabus to include um, different colleagues and groups in different ways. And in the process, I'm also figuring out, well, how do I not uh, make it so broad that now we're losing the focus and the presentation of a culture that is rarely seen in the same way? Um, and so I think that's a question, and I wanna, as much as I've talked about practitioners, I also wanna, again, name you know, Malik Najjar's work. It, you know, having so, When people write about your work in an academic way, and it is published, it is suddenly legitimate in this way, that you know, it exists, that you know, the history of the Arab American theater movement exists because it was put in a book, you know, because, and so um, the need for that, the importance of that, and then also the need for uh, conversations within all of these fields across every community around what is knowledge and what is research. Um, and I appreciate we just had a, convening at Gallatin and NYU about practice-based research and what does it mean and what can be qualified as research, what does you know what qualifies as knowledge, mm -hmm. which is a broader question that again is about who gets access and what kinds of intelligence and experience um, are valid within academic institutions. It's a huge part of decolonizing academia to validate personal experience of the peoples that were often written about. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I can say more about that, but I think the, that sense of what, how we classify knowledge and how we connect to each other's experiences of um, things like colonization, things like um, how our stories have been silenced or censored or controlled by others is, I think, very important. Oh, oh. Well, I, I mean, like you, that's why the more, the more we are in, in academia, the the more we can bring different perspectives. When Linda spoke about knowing the Arab American, I, I grew up in four continents, so for me, I'm interested in the diaspora. So when I'm teaching like the Arab diaspora and I go through the edu my syllabus, I wanna teach the Arabs in Europe, and then that gets very complex because you're looking at Scandinavia, you're looking at uh, uh, Germany, you're looking at, I mean, the experiences are very vast. The Arabs in Latin America, which I always have to explain that you know many do not call themselves Arab Latinos or hyphenate themselves. There have been in recent years some who have created you know for example the, the film festival and so forth. But in essence, it's a very different way in which they identify themselves. The Arabs that are um, in Africa, the Arabs that are in Asia, the Arabs that are Arab American, and my. My whole thing is I'm very interested in the stories and how they're speaking to each other in relation to where they came from and their experience, and most importantly, generationally. Mm -hmm. Because the experiences that are, when we speak about like Arab American, but oh my God, it's so vast mm -hmm. what an Arab American in the 20s, 50s, 80s, and now are experiencing. We have to speak. We can't.
can't just say Arab American like that. What generation? Yeah. What, what, how did they view themselves? These are all very important, um, important. And then the other thing is, because we mentioned earlier the idea of language, is how are we communicating with the greater, um, uh, the greater community in, in relationship to language? So there's the language of theater. And then there's also, you know, what language are we writing in? And how are we also communicating to our countries of origin? So all these things, but to go back to the students, because we're there, just allowing those students who all have incredible stories to connect to what we are teaching them um, and presenting them as wide and as varied um, text and plays and uh, films and so forth as possible. Really, I think that's where it is. That's where they can grow, and later on, they can choose where they want to um, place themselves. I just I wanted to say something uh, quickly about, um, and this is things that I'm still thinking through, but um, text-centric knowledge and mm. how like mm -hmm. how it's it's mm -hmm. some of the smartest people I know, my Iranian grandmother, Tuba, she, like, she communicated her knowledge to me without text, and, and um, so how can theater, the work that I do, embrace that? Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, this is important, because I, I recently got a fellowship to put together a database or a, a resource kind of website for educators, acting teachers, and even students uh, outside the traditional white male canon. And um, and I and I am open, you know, to to putting more MENA artists up there for for access. But I'm also finding that because of a lot of cultures have oral tradition and, and different ways of communicating, that uh, these texts. And I, I'm not sure if it should be someone's dissertation, like eth like an ethnography, to go out and you know, like as if you're an ethnomusicologist, you record. Maybe we need to start recording some of the stories that are being. Mm. Down. But I know I'm, I'm actually struggling with, with that project. And also devised, a lot of devised work these days is, mm -hmm. is trying to tackle and take on um, the challenge of, of text. Mm -hmm. I, I do find that, um, not to be all doom and gloom, but, but <laughs> something positive I do find is I do think now <coughs> is the time for uh, Men in Place to be introduced into college campuses. because. I do find that there is a, a difference in the outlook on the world between my, my students who are 18 and 19 now as opposed to 10 years ago when, when I was teaching the classes that there is, I, in a, I don't know, in a way of more openness to it. Um, an example I could give, and this is even more on, on like a more maybe subconscious or psychological um, level, I have a, a project where they create their own characters and they fill out this sheet and you know, what's their name, age, you know, gender, race, and all that, and uh, I find that I have I have a lot of you know Middle Eastern students that are that sign up for my class, um, and I you know ten years ago I would give this assignment to them, and every single student their character was white, um, regardless of what their ethnicity was, um, and now mm -hmm. I find now that my students create characters that are more similar to them, and. I think that that says something about the openness of the new audience that's being generated out there. Uh, because for me personally, I, I find an introduction to theater class is just a class to teach you about theater and help you to become a theater audience member, um, uh, to better know theater. And so um, this idea, I, I think that the new batch of students coming out don't want the, the white male canon that, that is the previous canon of, of you know, plays and, and musicals and everything out there. Um, so I think now is the time for this to happen. I think there's an openness to it. And kind of like we were saying, there is an element of gatekeeping that we need to find a way around. Um, I'm just thinking also in relation to access and sort of how and why plays do or don't get done overall, but certainly in academia as well. I just want to uh, raise something that, and Yusuf, forgive me if I'm, Shout out if I'm saying this wrong, but I just remember talking with you about this question of sort of casting and authenticity and casting and the, the, the balancing of um, wanting to make sure that when our plays are done, they have, you know, they are cast uh, appropriately 
and the way that the playwright wants them, and there's a Middle East, you know, someone who has some access to that culture playing those roles, but then also recognizing there are a lot of places in this country where there are not actors um, that, that have that cultural background, nor the budget to bring them in. Um, and so then are our plays not getting done? And how do we, you know, how do we balance wanting to have these stories told in a, in a broader selection of places with wanting to make sure that where that's important to the playwright, they're cast uh, authentically, that's such a loaded word, but you know, um, in a way that is honoring what's necessary to bring into the space in an embodied way around the culture. And so I think that question of casting to me is also related to access and, and um, yeah. Critically about, uh, I mean, uh, import, I'm thinking how important it is that we have this very permeable space between academia and and, uh, and the world out there, where where companies live and, and, and people who are professionals in the field. Um, that if we think of universities as a space for the construction of knowledge, and, and, and we think of art and performance as a an epistemic unto itself, right? Uh, as a way of knowing and understanding this unique to its, itself. Uh, the question of, of the embodied knowledge that, in this case, let's say, sort of not only the writers, directors, but uh, also the students who would be those on stage in these universities bring with themselves mm -hmm. is, is quite critical. So, it, so it's, it's uh, at least for Latinx folk like me, as in California, where the demographics are soon to be where we'll be majority, we still struggle with um, the, the fact that may not be enough Latinx students in the art programs and theater that will be a, ca a casting pool where we can put our necks out there and say, yes, we're gonna do this play by, by Shereen Moraga, uh, and we're going to cast it with those who belong in this stage at this university. You know, if I don't rally the Mecha student clubs and this and the other, so you better show up, you know, um, <laughs> I'm in trouble, right? Uh, how do you deal with this point that you're raising? I mean, is, is this something that uh, at a certain stage, we, there has to be concessions made and an openness that not, would not normally happen outside academia, or uh, the, 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 the recruitment and, and of, of, of students with a, with a, with a MENA background needs to be critically a part of the conversation, and of course, in addition, that they also don't go to uh, other careers where their parents we know, will tell them, you know, if you don't even think about going into theater, right? Uh, so how, how do you guys uh, deal with that? And, and, and you also being a, a, a student, you might have a perspective on this, may interest you, but uh, I'm asking this and, 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 and we'll opening it up, so. I just say one, one quick thing, uh, two quick things. One is um, I want to also say that I've had, ex I used to be very strict about authenticity and like, you know, in, in casting. And then I've had so many experiences where um, embodied knowledge is, there's a spectrum, right? So there are folks who come from two Arab parents but have never lived in the Arab country um, or you know, have different relationships to that culture and folks who have not a drop of Arab blood that grew up in their entire lives in an Arab country, for example. Uh, I've seen <coughs> Greek Cypriots play uh, Arabs in a way that is so, to me, look just like my uncle or my grandpa, you know, the, the embodiment. Um, although it is a different culture, there is a connection, right? So, so being mindful, and I say this to, uh, for to myself too, about the policing of that in, in a very rigid way, and at the same time being able to honor when it's important, particularly to uh, the playwright who is of that background, that this character needs to have this particular knowledge. I also, one of my favorite experiences in academia as a playwright was with uh, Andrea Asaf and Art to Action at USF Tampa, um, doing a play of mine that's about uh, you know, Lebanon and Israel and the 2006 war with students who had neither of those backgrounds and literally no <laughs> knowledge of <laughs> Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, any of that, and them stepping into those roles in, a, in an academic setting, it wasn't a production fully, but in that context was so valuable to their embodied experience of, of these places they had no knowledge of. So that also being something valid because they didn't have that knowledge and what acting can do to step into those shoes, so. Yeah. I agree with Leila. I, I think according to where they're at and the group of students that you're working in, and again, we're, we're, talk, we're speaking about where 
they are. Are they gonna go on stage or is it uh, more of a classroom? It's, there's a, there's a, it's an incredible journey for them to step into those roles and discover um, those characters and that, um, that space that they, they have no idea. And you know, it's so complex our world. There's been so many conflicts and really to, uh, one of the best ways is through art for them to enter that. Otherwise they're always standing away. I would just say, and I hope I'm not distilling it too much to, uh, I, I understand that it's complex, but the students won't come if, if there is no opportunity for them. So, so mm -hmm. if, if uh, there's a lot of planning that goes on in uh, departments for which shows they will do that season, mm -hmm. and if you're carefully thinking about which show you'll do, and if you're worried about if the students will come, allow them to have that opportunity. And I think if you say, this is our season, this is the show, come on out to auditions, and they see it in the programming, they see it, then why, I, I shouldn't say why wouldn't they come, but it, it gives them that sense of responsibility to, to show up. Um, I, I was just gonna add in too, I mean, when it comes to casting and, and authenticity, um, I mean, it is important for there to be an opportunity for uh, Middle Eastern students to be able to play mm -hmm. Middle Eastern roles, but there's, I think there's always like a, a double side to casting because the reason why we need that is because that same Middle Eastern student is not being considered for the role of Hamlet, yeah. Yeah. you know? Right. So yeah. when you're the only Middle Eastern student in the room, you're not going to be playing Willie Loman. You know what I mean? Like if that's all that you're doing. but. So it's a double-edged sword because I think about, you know, I brought up before, like the school I taught at in suburban Pennsylvania, we didn't have a single Middle Eastern student. So had we done a play, uh, a, a minute play, we wouldn't have been able to cast it that way. And so I think it, it, it's, I, I say it's a double-edged or two-sided thing yeah. because in order to be open for uh, non-Middle Eastern actors uh, playing Middle Eastern roles, then there also equally needs to be Middle Eastern actors and student actors being considered for non-Middle Eastern roles. Yeah, just to piggyback on that. Um, so in my experience in academia, it, it's a balance and it tends towards colorblind casting, I've found. And uh, the problematic piece is when you have the student who um, is a person of color and it's problematic if a person who's not a person of color plays that role, because obviously he has an embodied experience. But I found that it's mostly colorblind casting. That happens to give people a, a chance to give an African American man a chance to play Hamlet or a main actor to play something else. I found something odd in my classes. Most of my classes are majority people of color at Berkeley. Maybe I have four white students and the rest are all people of color because they've made a real effort to diversify the student body. Um, not true, faculty still mostly white, so upper echelons are mostly white, but the students. But what I found is because of what happens before college in high school and, and elementary school, um, there's a kind of indoctrination with, um, there's a kind of internalized racism that happens with the training yeah. that by the time they get to college, um, they've internalized it to the point where I'll give them a choice. I'll say, oh, you're from India. Oh, if you have something that you want to do for your monologue, we'll have, we'll have a translation. Do it in your, your language. Or, you know, I'm really encouraging everyone. And they um, pretty much are, are very much wanting to do the white male canon mm -hmm. <laughs> because of what um, the training has been before I get to them. So anyway, just thought that was interesting. Uh, and certainly for training uh, programs, that, that also can result in them trying to break the barriers and mm -hmm. have a job. Uh, as opposed to being considered only for certain roles. But we, we're mindful that, that we're getting another way by which we are in connection that, that well, we, in academia could certainly be the, the, the grounds for the training, the development of audiences and, 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 and actors, et cetera, that we don't begin to, to, to be a part of those vicious cycles that then continue to be perpetrated in the professional world. Can I just add something else to it? Because right now the question for us, at, at Berkeley anyway, is preparing people to audition for MFA programs mm -hmm. and, and also preparing them to audition for, for theater. Um, your audition material 
is it's problematic because we're, we're training them to get to take on anything in class, right? Mm -hmm. But then um, do we want them to internalize the self-perpetuating racism to play characters that only uh, through the racist lens of a white casting director can see them. Mm -hmm. So this is a conversation we're currently having. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, a uh, good place perhaps to, to, to know uh, more about what you guys are thinking on that side of the bright lights. Um, any, any, any comments? And I will, I, I, oops, I think I ha might have the microphone that can float, so. Any of them can float. Okay, I'll have mine float. Yeah, do you think, um, I'm the optimist, by the way, I'm, I'm here from LA. Um, I do think that, uh, that that casting is an important discussion to have, and I think it's related to academia very much, because faculty have so much say in casting and in university production. Um, I wanted to clarify, because when you said colorblind casting, I had a reaction, because I was like, oh, colorblind. But I understand what you're saying, you, like blind casting. So like, uh, so it's it's not like you don't see color. You do see color. You just, um, yeah. I just wanted you to clarify that because I feel like I had a reaction to it. I just want to make sure everyone understood what you actually meant. No, you're right. It's thank you for that. Um, it's a term that, I mean, all these terms are in flux, but this is a term that that we use often with um, casting and theater, meaning you would have. Uh, an opportunity for maybe a MENA actor to play Willie Loman. You w they wouldn't have to have the embodied white experience. You could have someone else play that role. Mm -hmm. So you, you would be blind to color. It doesn't work really if you're not on the target end of the racism. For example, there's a problem if a white person plays Othello. Othello. Mm -hmm. It's problematic. Mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's, a, it's a way of giving people opportunities based on this white male canon. Um, it's not intended to take parts away from people of color, or um, we don't always use people of color as a, you know, all of these words are in a way very problematic, and, and these signifiers are really not, they're not uh, to the point in a way, but often the, the, um, the term people of the global majority has been used also, different different terms, so that you're not identified, obviously, by color or being targeted, how you're targeted. And, and brown face is, is harder to combat in battling than black face, isn't it? Because there, there's, there's the brown face issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> hi, thank you all so much for your work. Um, one of the things that came up in our conversations this morning was the issue of criticism um, of professional theater, um, specifically Arab and Middle Eastern storytelling. And I was curious, um, the majority of the issues you addressed were about training performers, but what um, what are ways in ac what are ways that you conceptualize academia could potentially help in um, creating critics who are of color, who are Middle Eastern, or who are able to engage with that work on a deeper and more nuanced level? Usually, usually the critics would not be necessarily in our department. What we are teaching, you know, is more dealing. It's not so much dealing with criticism because a lot of the the students that are getting like PhDs and that are writing about theater and that are, they're the ones that um, would write about uh, uh, would write critically and in more academic books. But in relationship to uh, criticism for newspapers and so forth, I think. You know, first of all, we all could do it, and um, and those of us who, who who would like to do it can can do that. And I think I've seen much more um, uh, 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 criticism uh, out there. Not enough, but I've seen I've seen much more than the, there exists much more than before. So the idea is when you are with the students, because you're gonna have you don't know where they're gonna go from there, right? you also can bring that up because it's part of the training and part of the journey. I actually give them an assignment that they have to go see um, two plays and they have to write a critique of it. And so who knows, they might end up liking it and because until they go to the field and try many different things, they don't necessarily know where they, where they stand. And, any, and in any case, it's a good thing to do, right? So I think, um, I think really the
those of us who are in publishing and as educators who are connecting to those of us who are in publishing to creating these networks so that we know, listen, this, this playwright is presenting there, please send someone. I do that all the time, like for people I know in magazines, I say, can you cover this? Um, can you critique this? You know, wh whatever, whether it's books or, or uh, theater. So again, it goes back to community and networking and all of us here knowing each other and knowing that we can write for this magazine or that magazine and, and going, um, going forward. I would just say, for I, I was not a part of the, the discussion of this morning, so forgive me if this has been talked about, um, or just interrupt me if it has, um, but I think for me the question is actually more about what is the purpose of criticism, and where does it come from? Mm. Because for me, as, a, as an artist, I don't want to be critiqued by someone who has never actually done the thing they're critiquing, mm -hmm. um, doesn't understand the complexity of what we're trying to do from the inside. Um, and uh, so I, I feel, and that, I'll just say that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do in the class that I teach is, and it, it kind of, the poor students, the, especially the first, you know, the first time I taught it, I was figuring it out, was it's a writing workshop, so they're writing, not a full play, just, you know, scenes that they get to work on throughout the semester um, that have to include, a, you know, an, uh, an Arab character in that case, and this next semester it can be broader, you know, a character from a culture that is not your own um, is really the, um, whatever that means to you. Um, and then they are also reading critical theory about representation, about the history of, in that, you know, whether it's specifically Arab American or, you know, um, and so we're having these conversations about representation and questions of how we write and who gets to write what and what it means to have, you know, all these questions. And they would come to me and they would say, it's really hard to move from the creative, let me just write my thing brain, to the, oh, but I wrote this thing, and is that because of my bias about this and my <laughs> assumption about that? And it's, those are very you know, different brains, and um, I feel like anyone who's going to write about theater or anything should have some experience from the inside in doing it, and also that the purpose should not be, this is good, this is bad, this should be produced, this should get, get good box office, you know, but really more about, as a community, asking ourselves, for me, I, it's about asking each other the same questions I would ask myself, which is, huh, why am I choosing that for this character? Or what is my perspective on this thing that I'm writing about? Whether it's mine or not, you know? Um, as, a, as a way of uh, making my work as meaningful or purposeful as possible, not better or worse than someone else's, right? But I, I'd argue a little, although I, as an artist, I, I agree with that, but, on the, uh, but there is a structure, okay? And so if we want to integrate, for example, these plays in, the, in uh, classes and other classes that we are not teaching, if we want other academics, oftentimes they don't have the background. And if they have a text that can help guide them, uh, it helps them to integrate that text mm -hmm. in, in their curriculum. I hear that all the time, like I, I write a piece and they say, oh, this really helped me teach this, um, this, this play. Or th they tell me, uh, would you mind if I, you know, I asked you a few questions to help me guide, whether it was something in relationship to, to the historical part of the play or wh what, whatever, that's one. And in relationship to magazines, I mean, if you have a play out and you have a New York Times review of the play, it takes you, it opens up a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is simply, <laughs> the way that it, we, the community and the structure of things. So we cannot, um, we have to take that into consideration. And as a community, we have to have more reviewers out there mm -hmm. and we have to connect with them. But I'm, I don't think those things are in opposition. I think right. that we have to also challenge that, we also have to challenge that structure. And I, you know, and that's all I'm saying is the people who are doing that and who are defining the careers financially and otherwise of artists, mm -hmm. yeah. I think need also to be held accountable for where they're coming from. And, <coughs> and that should be a larger conversation about that structure. I think too, in terms of how, it, like for your question, how do you, uh, help cultivate uh, uh, critics and, and critique of, of MENA uh, work. There, I mean, there's obviously many good qualified writers out there right now who should be writing about it, and we need to figure out a way to get them into those positions. But in terms of me as a, as a, a professor dealing with students at, at a young age, at that point, I feel like it's a matter of also helping to teach 
uh, this generation how to express these, these issues that they see. Because I can give you an example right now. I, I just recently, uh, last week, um, uh, was talking about Waiting for Godot, and I had a Latinx student say, well, this is a very white play, you know? And I said to her, like, okay, so what does that mean? You know, like, expand on that. Like, you have this impulse, what does that mean? And so to help, um, um, you know, either uh, men of students or Latinx students or, or uh, whoever, when they get out into the world, once we create these opportunities that we still have this, um, I guess what would you call it, like influx of writers who can write uh, about that. And so at least in the college level, I think it's about um, teaching or giving students the freedom and the, the uh, uh, not courage, but the um, confidence to write about it, right? I think of um, a student I had one time, this isn't critique, but I had them write a play. She was a, a Latinx student, very quiet, never really spoke up, and I told her to write about something she knows, and she ended up writing this beautiful short play about someone trying to cross the border, mm -hmm. um, and then it turned, and all of the problems they face, and then the person wakes up, and they're back in Mexico, and a speech of Donald Trump is in the background, and it brought the whole class to tears, but I think that the point is when these students are in academia, at least in some instances, they're being told if they just in another class jump up and say, waiting for those a very white play, the professor's saying, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Figure out a different way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So I think what, to answer to your question, what you do is we have to cultivate a way yeah. at the early stage to better articulate mm -hmm. um, what the problem is or what you see or what you want uh, from the students. We have a question from... Hello. Um, so this is all, I've been ruminating on this. <clears throat> I'm really interested in like a collective hum and it feels like this moment is the culmination of a lot of things. And I've been ruminating a lot on like Arab futurity and what does an Arab uh, an aesthetic of an Arab future look like, or Middle Eastern rather, with being informed by, but not being defined by the trauma of our past mm -hmm. and colonization, and also the ongoing trauma of neo-colonialism, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, imparted by the US <coughs> imperial war machine. I like, <clears throat> so in your estimation, what do you think and what are you actively doing to help this, you know, I'm only three years out of college, to help our generation define this Arab futurity and the aesthetics of it and what does it mean? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in terms of my own lived experiences, I recently, probably within the past two years, um, held a lot of resentment towards my family. And I think that that stems from um, the trauma that my family experienced being ripped from their home. and. If I don't do the work for myself, um, I can't move forward. So I guess for me, it's starting here and producing something that hopefully will empower others to either work on themselves. It, it's still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same. It's, yeah, I, 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 for me, there is no answer than looking in a mirror and seeing how I have been conditioned to behave just sharing that story. Well, I, I don't know about speaking to the Arab, I mean, Iranian background, but um, I know that, I love how you said that, that um, the, the experience of war and causes not defining you, but being informed. I know for myself that I was reaching, a point, was, even Torian asked me to do a, um, a play reading once, and a woman was in jail, and she was, uh, there. Um, I don't know, it's because, it's so hard because war has so <laughs> shaped and informed the experience. And yet, and me as an actress, I took this stand for a while. It's, I think it's over now, that stand I took. But it was a stand <laughs> where I just wanted to do comedy. And I just thought, you know, I just, I need to laugh. People need to laugh. Can I just laugh here? Uh, and everyone wanted to, I was constantly being cast as the victim and in jail and, you know, mm. raped a lot and just having <laughs> horrible experiences, you know, with war. I mean, it was a thing, and um, so anyway, for a while, I, I was just like, I totally respect it, find another actress, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And just to that, I mean, uh, 
to the embodied thing, what are we also, and I ask myself this, I try to ask myself this as a playwright, as well as an actor, what are we asking people to embody, right? And when is that re-traumatizing? Or when is that, you know, um, because there's a, there's a beautiful power in what we, uh, what actors do on stage, and what, you know, um, but it can be, you know, depending on how it is handled and what the experience is, sometimes we're asking people to channel their personal experiences or channel, I believe, ancestral things, um, or just fit into something where actually I don't have experience of war, or I don't, you know, um, sort of fit that trope. Um, so in general, not just within our communities, but overall, I would say, um, what are we asking actors to embody and how is that perpetuating or breaking cycles um, viscerally for people? When is it good to represent that thing and when is it just perpetuating? You asked about a future, how, well, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> things keep evolving and every generation brings, to, now we have a whole new experience of this generation. We also have um, new, new migrants, right? You're working with, for example, I was working with my Palestinian migrants who had their parents were refugees from 48 in Syria, and then now they have left Syria, and now they're refugees in Berlin. And so we, things keep moving, right? In our region with, you know, one thing after another, it really changes. So the future is really, uh, first, <coughs> we, we don't know, but what I hope is that we can listen and read and see as many diverse voices as possible. And when we come as a community where people are trying to find a space, for example, if we want to read, we were in theater and they have a play and they have this platform and connecting, I think that's the most <coughs> important, that we can march towards the future together and, and stronger. Hmm. Well, there's a question here. Uh, was, there, is there, was there a hand up there because the light sometimes, <coughs> no, okay. Actually, this is not a question. I, uh, just to offer a more positive uh, uh, view, I'd like to share some experience. Uh, I, uh, I started teaching at the uh, university when some of you were not even born, uh, 1981. And uh, at that time, there was uh, perhaps in all the uh, conferences, there was maybe one or two uh, Middle Eastern professors uh, that you could just say hello in a different language. Um, and I think I've seen a great growth yeah. in both uh, students and the faculty. Uh, so there's something to, that we should all be proud of. Um, sitting here and listening to you, I think that we can contribute that to three things. Uh, admission, adaptation, and education. Now I'll explain. Admission, one of the things I've tried to do, when I came to, uh, uh, you know, to the college where I'm teaching, and I've been teaching for the past 20 years, there was not a single foreign person on the faculty or in the students. Mm -hmm. It was a completely white Catholic school. And uh, it was fascinating because nobody wanted to call my name. They <laughs> wanted to give me a different name. Mm -hmm. And I had to insist, no, this is, this is the name. Learn it. Uh, so very early on, I started uh, getting involved with the admission of so when parents would come there, mm -hmm. I would talk to them in their language. Mm -hmm. For example, we all know that the uh, theater and film industry are among the top money making in the world. Now we don't say that we have 800,000 uh, actors in New York City who are voting, uh, waiting on tables, but <laughs> if, you do the, if you do the math, they really, in average, these people make a lot of money. So that entices the parents to, uh. to really resist less. They still resist, resist less the attempt of their students, uh, their young uh, 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 children to want to at least take a course in life. The second thing is adaptation. I learned that you can really get people involved with understanding the Middle East through adopting the plays that are already familiar with them. Mm -hmm. Example, uh, the Rose Tattoo can easily be adapted to a Middle Eastern community in Brooklyn, New York, in Atlantic Avenue, New York. Mm -hmm. Easy. 
We just did the production of Hamlet put in the green movement Iran. Mm -hmm. And it really worked. People came from all over. Um, we just have, uh, we are just doing a production of Dario Fo, uh, the open couple, which is adapted for the Iranian community that came to America after, after the green movement. You know, and they all work. They all really work. So people become a little less scared of, of hearing about our part of the world. Remember, we are the troublemakers. <laughs> we are the troublemakers of, of this world. And our uh, young uh, you know, uh, children think of us as that. You know, as soon as you speak in an accent, you're a troublemaker. Mm. So that's the second thing. And then uh, the, uh, the, the education. We all have, and I assume that in your uh, universities, you also have topic courses, right? Do you? Topic courses that you can choose what to teach? Well, I pick it up on myself that every single semester, I offer some kind of Middle Eastern art course as a topic course. Right now, I'm teaching film and social change in the Middle East. We're talking about what happens in the Middle East through social media. Through film, what does uh, you know the Arab Spring look like if there was no Al Jazeera? What would it look like? Mm. You know, and that all of these uh, <coughs> somehow familiarizes our students. It is not we are, we are we are really facing a revolution. We want to make a revolution in the American education institution. And to borrow uh, Mao's phrase, revolution is not a dinner party. It's not going to happen overnight, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> Let's, you know, you guys are much younger than me, so continue, continue educating your colleagues as well as uh, your students to trick history, find ways of <laughs> trick history to understand. You know, we were, through trick history, I was able to get money from my college to bring Frank and Roberta and Moti Lerner. And I start adapting to play there, you know, in a small college in upstate New York, that that place then ended up in, <laughs> in, in here, in Golden Thread. And in Los Angeles, you know, uh, work different festivals. So there's really, there are all these possibilities. Let's look at the positive and how we can move forward. Mm -hmm. I also want to say, just to piggyback on that quickly, uh, to the point you raised, I think we also as a community, as communities, to make the generalization, need to encourage our communities to value the arts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that is a big part of also yeah. why we don't have more students, yes. is that they are not encouraged to yeah. study yeah. the arts. So I think we have to also call ourselves out on that. Oh, totally. I just have to piggyback. So <laughs> UC Berkeley, I mean, um, at this point, the STEM classes, that, that just dominates, and my students in my acting classes, a lot of them, well, a lot of, most of them are studying math, engineering, mm -hmm. computer science, mm -hmm. and, and in their heart of hearts, they don't want to be actors, but um, a lot of people, especially if their parents are immigrants, have a certain, um, a certain need for financial viability, Absolutely. and mm -hmm. understandably so. Anyway, and people coming from other countries for their green cards when they're studying here. So I, anyway, I think the art, uh, just, just to think back on what you said, um, the arts might be important in, in their hearts, but um, the practicality of, of paying rent or of trying to make a living <laughs> is squeezing out some of these um, first generation of the um, immigrants. Uh, just to add on that and also bring back what you had said about interdisciplinary at the beginning, some of the work that I'm doing um, with the applied theater in applied theater is um, a creativity. So I, I, I go into bioengineering classrooms and work with yeah. students and say, how do you communicate the knowledge that you have to your audience? Mm. Because a lot mm. of students in science classes, um, although some have this natural ability or did theater in high school mm. to communicate, uh, it's just not valued in those classes. So that's, for me, that's been a touch point to mean us students that aren't involved in the arts but are in science classes. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I get this question a lot sometimes from my students too about like, they just literally ask, well, how do you make a living at this? <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I tell them that you can make a living um, in, you know, being a, a theater artist, but it's going to take a lot of work. But the thing I remind them is that there seems to be this impression that 
well, you know, like if I study biology, then I'm just gonna walk into a six-figure job as a doctor. And I say, all of these safe things that you're studying, you're not just gonna walk into a job, like it takes a lot of work. The same amount of work that it's gonna take for you to be a, you know, a, a working actor or something like that. And sure, maybe the upside of earning, you might earn a little more, but this I, it's not a safe bet. No matter what you major in, you're gonna end up doing a ton of work, so you might as well do the thing that you enjoy, and some, and then sometimes that sometimes gets through to, to some people. I don't know if it'll get through to their parents, but <laughs> at least it, it gives them a little bit of hope to do what they want to do. I tell them, do you want to make a living or do you want to make a life? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, uh, there was a hand over there, and a storage, and, and there was a hand behind the storage, and I think that might be Maybe a third one if we, if we push it, but we're close to the time. Yeah, I just wanted to double check. Am I understanding this correctly that you're not teaching Middle Eastern plays in your classroom because you can't cast it with your students? Did I hear that right? Um, because, I it, because you don't have Middle Eastern students and no. I misunderstood. So mm -hmm. well, that's I, not the case. Yeah, I, I certainly don't do that. I mean, uh, the text comes first and then people get to interpret because they're interpreting literature. So for me, the text is all important. Yeah, I know whether or not we have Middle Eastern, I mean, I have a lot, but whether you have it or not, for me, I, I believe in the text. So you are teaching Middle Eastern plays and you are casting them with students in your classroom who are not of Middle Eastern heritage. Um, have I done that? Well, I have a lot of students. Really. Actually, I did some where I had some South Asian students actually playing some um, oh, Middle Eastern yeah. parts. Yeah, I, I did do that. Yeah, because I, I just want to say that, I mean, part of our challenge on the production side is to meet, to audition actors who are already familiar with this canon, right. whether they are of Middle Eastern heritage or not. Uh, part of the problem with critics is that they're not, they don't yeah, learn right. these plays in school, right? So they come, they see a production, they don't even, they have no context, no background for understanding it. So my hope is that all of you are teaching plays from or about the Middle East in your classrooms, regardless of who <laughs> your students are, so that they can dig into the material. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, real quick? Just like I said, I'm a graduate student, so as far as my appointments go, they are given to me, like the hierarchy of, so I'm not in a position where I uh, instruct plays to students yet. Um, so that's. And of you course, really if you're a, a syllabus, I will. Be plays you before you know who's going to sign up for the class or not. Yeah. So, oh, okay. yeah, you pick what you're going to Right, so you know bef you have to have it before. Um. I appreciate this conversation. Um, there, I, you know, I went to um, a, a, a graduate program where it was like a majority Latinx. I did cast my play with majority Latinx. I think speaking to your uh, point about, well, you know, uh, a person is not going to be cast as Hamlet, like we're all dealing with that struggle cr across communities of color. It's not... Uh, it, you know, in the MENA community, we do deal with that, and there's a lack of representation. Um, but uh, but but everyone's dealing with that, so it's okay. It's okay to have. And I, I'm not saying you, you said anything against that. It's just I'm just speaking to your point. Um, my question's for Roberto, actually. Um, uh, so I, you know, I'm I'm of MENA descent, and this is just like a, a question to academics. Um, but uh, I I've come up in in, in Los Angeles. In, in like a renaissance of like Latinx theater. And I engage with that all the time, but I do ask the question, this is gonna make me cry. Um, I do ask the question all the time, like can I, can I partake in that conversation or, or is, it, is it appropriate for me to play the role of a Latinx person? Um, you know, I don't wanna engage in brown face, you know, cause it, it can, there are, it's like different story, it's different backgrounds, but there's also, you know, there's, there is, there has been a conversation between the, the Middle East and Latin America for a long time. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm just looking for a little bit of guidance in, in that world. Mm -hmm. I, I, we can talk afterwards uh -huh. too, but um, I, I just thinking about West Side Story, 
Yeah. Uh, we're talking about brown face, right? The, the, so the, the gang uh, of Puerto Ricans was uh, mostly cast with Latino Middle Eastern people um, who were the exotics mm -hmm. at the time. But they all had to wear brown face on top of their brown faces because they had to match Natalie Wood's brown face. Right. So she wouldn't look weird, right? So that was a space of solidarity that wasn't intended. Uh, but that, that was developed, um, where, where, where perhaps uh, those involved began to look at each other now as, as part of uh, their same community. And, and I feel sort of that way about, uh, uh, that there's so many examples uh, outside of that horrible one of, uh, uh, say, Guillermo Gómez Peña with his Chicaranian project where you have to go online and, 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 and actually click and see if you can guess who's Iranian and who's Mexican. And, and you know, you know, hope you get it wrong, right? Uh, and at the same time, we're getting it right because we're all we're all the same. In a way, we're we are uh, creating a space of of, of connectivity. Um, I think uh, we're both, um, as it was said earlier uh, uh, by, um, I forgot your, your name, but I appreciate your point. You know, because I related to uh, you know people who could pass as white, uh, but were members of a community of color, and um, uh, that we are multi. Uh, uh, racial people, um, but that we are a, a, a tied together by profound cultural roots and that need to be acknowledged and framed in this country as a space of solidarity. Uh, you know, we belong in communities of color that to me are, 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 are not just spaces of resistance, but spaces of affirmation. Because who wants to blend in with a mainstream that, that it sort of washes them into, into sameness? Uh, so in that sense, I, I, I feel that both by virtue of, of, of life experiences that are very, very similar um, and, and that other important space of representation with, with what do we look like, um, um, there's, there's a lot to be done and connect within our communities and, and uh, I know that ultimately would result in somebody's op opinion or not or, and, or you know, gatekeeping or not. Uh, but uh, in my book, um, um, we are always welcome. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you like the, the sole voice. <laughs> no, no. <so. laughs> Excuse me for that. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, I mean, we, we started, I think I, I may have ended up here because uh, at some point we were talking about this as part of Reorient with, uh, with, with Garange. So what are the connections that our communities can, 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 can experience and learn from one another? Um, we are, we are at time, unfortunately, so um, uh, with, with that and hoping that this continues and, and that you all can, if you haven't uh, yet seen the place, you're coming in a couple of hours to the same spot to uh, enjoy this amazing uh, place. Let's give our panelists a round of applause.